Good morning and welcome back from our break. It is a delight to see you one and all. Uh, just reminding you the hashtag for the convention, AACon15. Please be sure to tweet. Uh, a lot of great content, I'm sure, from our next speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, no further ado, Eddie Tabish. Well, good morning, everybody. First, let me freely admit that this will not be one of my more inspirational presentations. This is not going to be my every presidential year, the sky is falling because of the Supreme Court. This is not going to be how to present atheism to the average person by explaining God can't digest because he doesn't have physical intestines. This is not going to be the usual firebrand, rousing warning cry that I give, but in a sense it is. We're here in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's not lost on me that this is the city where 47 years ago Martin Luther King was assassinated. And he made a comment once that the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. As much as I wish that were true, it's not going to be true unless we make it true. There is a tremendous gap between our resources and those of the religious right. But there's also a political knowledge gap which we have to fill. They are much more effective at using and succeeding in the political system than we atheists are at this point in American history. And so we're going to have to discuss something very dry and technical, but it is an aspect of political life that is a key element in how the religious right has managed to achieve so much. We're going to be talking about the world of ballot measures and about how to successfully support and oppose ballot measures that are appearing regularly and that the religious right has used with so much success. First, I want to speak about ballot measures generically. There is a problem with them, and this is not to say that the people, all of us, whether we like a particular measure or not, don't have a right to have them. But when you have a ballot measure, you are frequently enacting ill-thought-through laws because you are not going through the vetting process of legislative committees. They are ideologically driven, and the people with the most money are able to succeed in their passage or in their defeat. In recent history, in our pitched battle against the religious right, we have seen in my home state of California, perhaps the worst example of what money and ballot measures can do to the separation of church and state. When the California Supreme Court courageously threw out the ban on same-sex marriage in 2008, on the November general election ballot, there was a measure to amend the Constitution of California to reinstate the ban and it won, and it was funded by a $30 million contribution from the Mormon Church and a $30 million contribution from the Catholic Church. And it took years to have it overturned in the court. So let's talk about how these things come about. A ballot measure, when it's used to enact a new law, to bypass the legislature is called an initiative. When it is meant to repeal an existing law, it is known as a referendum. Now, each state has different laws regarding ballot measures. However, we right now, as a group of people, we atheists, do not have the financial resources 
to successfully compete in the legal aspects of dealing with these tricky, tricky ballot measures that appear or that we want to appear or want to oppose. So my first recommendation is this. In whatever state you are, remember that in terms of ballot measures that we care about, which will invariably touch upon the separation of church and state, we will be on the same side as the ACLU. If you want to support or oppose a ballot measure, you have to go to the ACLU, say you're on the same side, ask them to provide the legal resources to do what we need to do to make sure we are in technical legal compliance. Now, every state is different, but you have to get a sizable number of signatures to qualify a measure for the ballot in any given state. In my home state of California, to qualify a measure for the ballot that would just change the law, you need 501,000 valid signatures. To qualify a ballot measure that would change the California Constitution, you need 800,000 signatures. You also have to make sure that in the state in which you are promoting a ballot initiative, that you are careful to investigate the following questions. And that is, can you have paid signature gatherers? Do all the individual petitions, as in California, have to be for one county and other petitions for other counties where you can't mix signatures from each county? Do individual registered voters have a right, as they do in California, to withdraw their names from a petition? What is the length of time in between being clear to circulate petitions and the last drop dead date in which you have to turn the petitions back into the various aspects and localities of government in order to qualify for the ballot. Also, as in some states, if you submit a ballot measure for consideration, does your state legislature have the opportunity to hold hearings on it, and even though they can't amend it, will they comment on it? Also, if the ballot measure that you are supporting or opposing would result in an expenditure for your state or local government, do you have a situation in which the Legislative Budget Commission or the equivalent in your state will be permitted, as happens in many states, to be able to affix to your ballot measure when it actually appears on the general election ballot an estimate of the cost to the taxpayers. I know this is a lot of information, but this is something that we all have to know. The other thing that we need to watch out for are not just state ballot measures, but local ballot measures. What if somebody in your county wants to circulate a petition or in your city, let's say the city council has refused to have in God we trust as the city motto. And yet what happens is some religious people are circulating a ballot measure and trying to get the signature so it's on your city's ballot. Well, in most cities, unfortunately, that would have a good chance of passing once it gets on the ballot. So if we are opposing ballot measures, which we have done thus far because we don't have the resources to be proactive, this is what you ask your local ACLU. In some states, if a ballot measure is going to be on its face unconstitutional, you may be able to go to court and have it kicked off the ballot even if it gets the required numbers of signatures because it is facially unconstitutional and it means that the courts will not allow the people to enact something which clearly could not be enforced. You need to be able to determine this early on. If your state does not allow paid signature gatherers, 
Some states do and some don't. This may be a way of challenging it. Also, when you submit a ballot measure for a statewide election ballot, you have to get clearance from and a summary from the state attorney general. Many times you can fight the opposition at that level. For instance, in California in 2008, though we lost Prop 8, we defeated a measure that would have provided that minors could not have access to abortion unless they notify their parents. And of course, if they're religious parents, they'd physically stop them from finding access to abortion. And the proponents wanted the Child Medical Protection Act. And we wanted it to be the Barring of Minor Access to Abortion Act. And finally, it came out to the Parental Notification Act, but that's better than the Minor Protection Act. But had we not been able to fight it at that level, the anti-choice proponents would have gotten a favorable wording on the ballot. Now, I know this is very dry, and I know this is very technical, but let me now relate the question of ballot measures to my usual firebrand speech that the sky is falling because of the Supreme Court. Because the sky has half fallen already, here is the problem. More and more, our religious right-wing leaning, though it's not yet gone all the way, our religious right-wing leaning Supreme Court is starting to allow the individual states to decide questions that all of us believe should be determined by the federal constitution. More and more, you can chip away at abortion rights, you can chip away at these things because the Supreme Court where decades ago it would say, no, there are national constitutional standards, now they're saying this is within the purview of states' rights. The more issues we care about are divested of national constitutional protection and the more they are then given over to the states to decide, the more the religious right will use state ballot measures to enact what they want because the more they get what they want in the states, either through the legislature or a vote of the people of those states, the less of a danger the religious right will face that the federal courts will declare it unconstitutional because the federal courts are now giving the states more and more latitude to enact these types of measures. So this is why it's very, very important that we learn how to navigate ballot measures in each of our states, even though we don't have the resources to use and to hire technically competent lawyers in the area like they do. And this is why I suggest going to the ACLU, because again, I cannot conceive of any ballot measure which we atheists would support or oppose, which would not have the ACLU on our side because they're always with us on church state separation issues. So this is a resource. This is a resource we have when we can't afford to do otherwise. Now, in the event that we are able to raise money to support or oppose a ballot measure, it becomes, as in political campaigns, a battle of the sound bites. The way elections are being conducted now in major metropolitan areas is not just through TV and radio, but it's the mailers, those placard cards that come that try to persuade the voters with the right buzzwords. We have to learn, as the religious right has learned, how to hire top-notch campaign consultants to frame the wording of the issue. If we don't do that, 
the other side will always prevail. Now, let's say that they have more money than we do, which is likely any time we are up against the religious right to persuade the voters of the state to accept or reject a ballot measure. We need then to amass an army of volunteers to go door to door to the voters and carry our spin, to carry our spin. So for instance, in California in 2008, parental notification, we would go to voters and they would say, well, we're not too happy about kids having abortions on their own. And we would say, do you want children having children? And then we would say, do you want little girls dying of back alley illegal abortions because they were frightened to talk to their parents? So even though we were trailing, we did have, because the pro-choice movement does have more money than we do, we were able to be somewhat competitive, but the other side outspent us. We still won because we were able to have enough resources to put the proper spin on it. So even some moderate conservative people that don't want 14-year-old girls being able to just get an abortion without their parents knowing about it, they also don't want those girls winding up in back alley illegal abortions because they were too afraid to talk to their religious parents who once being advised of their condition would try to stop them from having the abortion. So. Now again, as I said, I know this is dry and technical, but look how the religious right has mastered the dry and technical aspects of legislative enactment since they came on the scene in the 1980 elections 35 years ago. What we also have to do is if you are supporting or opposing a ballot initiative, you have to find out if your state has what's known as the one subject rule. That means, as we do in California, an individual ballot initiative must deal with only one subject. So, if in your state there is a one subject rule and very well wealthy religious right wingers circulate a ballot to have in God we trust printed on high school footballs and at the same time to have young kids counseled that abortion is murder, you have two subjects and you might be able to have the ballot initiative declared invalid even if our opponents have the adequate number of signatures to qualify it. Once again, knowledge is power. The more we can have legal help in figuring out the Byzantine laws of ballot measures in each of our states, the greater the chance we have of defeating our opponents on a technicality. And we've done this a few times. Sometimes the religious right with a lot of money will try to cover the waterfront in one single ballot initiative. And they get more than the signatures they need, but we keep them off the ballot. Why do we keep them off the ballot? because we were able to have the courts declare the measure completely in violation of law because it violated the one subject rule. Also, we need to learn how to get involved with coalitions. I tried to make very, very sure that the free thought atheist secular humanist movement was very prominent in the effort to defeat Proposition 8 in uh, the 2008 presidential election year in California. Again, there will never be a ballot initiative that worries us that is not going to intersect with violations of separation of church and state. Now, let's take the opposite side just momentarily. What happens? What happens if the United States Supreme Court, which could happen, sets us back decades and rules this year that there is no 
federal constitutional right for persons of the same gender to marry each other and thus nullify the victories we have had to date. And it's up for the states to decide. Well, many of us will say, let's go into the several states and let's qualify for the ballot a measure where the people would enact and allow same-sex marriage in their state. We obviously know we'd be outspent the first few years, but we join with the gay community, we join with the general civil liberties community, and we say we want to be part of this. Because the one thing that we atheists must learn from the gay community in terms of obtaining political clout that no one ever thought they would ever achieve, the one thing we must learn is how to raise money from our own so we can be successful in legislative battles and in electing our own to office. There is no group that has been a victim of historical hatred by religious fundamentalists that has now been more successful in American political life than the gay community. And they did it by the discipline of raising enough money and making allies so that they could achieve more progress than we would have thought 20 years ago, even if we sustain a very bad loss in the Supreme Court. We have to learn from that. Also, in this room, there is enormous intellectual firepower. We have to use our mental discipline to dive into and deal with these very dry areas of technical politicking. Because after 35 years of entrenchment, the religious right is not getting any weaker. They still have the money. And again, a little preview of what I'll be shouting about next year, not anybody's surprise. If the wrong person gets into the White House, there goes the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court nullifies church-state separation, a majority of states will start enacting religion-promoting legislation that will be coming at us so fast we won't know what to do about it. Again, we have to learn how to function and operate in the state legislatures. So I know that the technical aspects of ballot initiatives are dry. The various technical legal requirements for support and opposition are dry. And I know that it's not that inspirational to deal with these issues, but in terms of boots on the ground, in terms of learning to beat the religious right, we atheists must become more competent in the political and legislative process because what is at stake, as we all know, is whether or not America will continue on its march to be a modern secular democracy or whether it will slouch into being some kind of theocracy. And in the end, it's up to us to save the founding purpose of the United States. Thank you. have a few moments for a couple of questions. Uh, are there any? I, well, first one I see is right here. Okay. One moment. We're going to wait for the mic, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my, my only question, that there is a question in here. You may use the word spin. And a lot to me, what we're trying to do is educate. And I just wanted to ask you, for instance, when you, on this door-to-door, -door, if you start talking about the questions to me are like, what are the percentage of young girls that get pregnant from, say, age 10 to 17 per bracket, like a graph? Uh, how does it affect if that pregnancy? How does it going to, if they have the child versus not have the child? What's the, what are the poverty rates? Yeah. What are the health uh, issues? What are the crime issues with, with, with them and their children? Okay, uh, those educational, are, those, those type of things. So I, I just, I, I had a problem with the word spin. 
I didn't talk about sin. Spin, S-P-I-N, sorry. You talked about giving spin, our spin, our spin, spin, okay, spin, spin, okay. As far as spin is concerned, remember this. In today's America, political campaigns are won by who has the resources to get out the message most likely to persuade the voters. That's what we mean by spin. It doesn't mean we're not telling the truth. It means that we are taking the reality and wording it in a diplomatic or auspicious way that we know will have the most impact on the voters. And in order to do this, remember the second part of what I said, we need to be able to afford the political consultants who are masters at this. The other side does that. The other side gets the very best political spinmeisters in America and is able to hire them to craft the wording. So again, we're not talking about saying something that isn't true. We are talking about tailoring how we express the truth so that we have a fighting chance to win the election. Um, I, I've just moved to South Carolina, and I would like to tackle the in God we trust on all the license plates. Where do I start? Okay, first of all, in God we trust on the license plates issued by the state. I think there's some lawsuits pending on that. But let's say that our lawsuits lose, and we all believe in God we trust should not be on state-issued license plates. Unfortunately, the reality that we're facing is that it's be very, very difficult in a state like South Carolina to get the voters to agree to take it off. So we might wanna to have to pick our battles. But let's say that 10 years from now, it's a little more likely, and non-believers are a little more accepted the way we word it is the effort to remove in God we trust is not an attack on your religion, South Carolina voters. It's an effort for inclusiveness for all of us. We respect your religion and your beliefs, but we non-believers just want to be equal citizens too. Again, we are not lying or adding any untruth. We're not weakening our position but we are wording it in a way to give us a fighting chance because ultimately all elections are about persuasion. The side that persuades the voters the most successfully is the side that wins the election, be it candidate or ballot measure. And we cannot afford to avoid learning how to play the political game. Atheists will survive and flourish in America and we will only avoid being second-class citizens ultimately if we are just as good as the religious right in playing the political game. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.